Good morning, sir. Good morning, Dr. Shobha Sridhar. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Ah, great, sir. Doing great. Nice. So, shall we start the meeting? Yes, sir. Darshana, you can start. Very good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Good morning, all the participants. Good morning, Shobha, ma'am. Uh, thank, thank you for joining us uh, just today. Um, we get waiting for participants to join in, but in the meantime, uh, we've decided to start. Uh, I invite Shobha, ma'am, uh, to have the opening speech as well as to start up with our presentation. Uh, before uh, Dr. Shobha starts, I shall, uh, you know, <clears throat> give a few thoughts of me as opening remarks. Since I'm uh, in a closed car and still wearing the mask, Corona fear is continuing for the purpose of safety of myself and others. So I hope my audio is clear. Yes, sir, you're clear. I can say that uh, the, one of the best things that have happened under the Companies Act 2013 is uh, 233 invention. Because it has paved way for, uh, you know, the fast track uh, approval of or sanctioning of uh, scheme of mergers and demergers. Therefore, I would uh, first of all the, say that this is a beautiful provision that has uh, been brought into the statute book for the purpose of enabling ease of doing business. But there are caveats. There are certain companies which are alone permitted to undergo this process or uh, under, you know, use this, avail the benefits of this process. Another important feature of this process which I have learned is that up front, you get the objections, if any, from regulators, so that that will be considered at the meeting and you may be in a position to look at your scheme, modify, get it approved, and get it uh, approved with the regulators. So this is another very interesting feature of this scheme. But I always say that in 233 also, it is possible for two things. That I will uh, explain at the end of this meeting. Two things are possible. Number one, it is possible to cut down the process further. At the same time, it is possible to expand the scope also further. With these two opening remarks, I would request the speakers of the day, Dr. Shobha Sridhar and Darshana, to take it forward. Over to Dr. Shobha Sridhar. She is, uh, for your information, she is speaking from Jalandhar. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Shobha. Yes, thank you so much, sir. And uh, good morning, everyone. And it's indeed my pleasure to be uh, speaking here about uh, mergers and demergers without going to the NCLT today. Uh, I would like to request Darshana, if you have the PPT, you can share it because I will only be speaking on this. Okay, so uh, sir has set the right tune uh, for the topic uh, today. He has uh, given us one of the more wonderful uh, initiations, that is section 233, uh, which is one of the things which has uh, started the ease of doing business. So I will be uh, going through with the overview of the provisions of section 233 of the Companies Act. Uh, 2013, read with rule 25 of the company's compromise arrangements and amalgamation rules 2016. Uh, as we are all quite aware, uh, corporate restructuring is one of the most uh, sought after things with uh, the present uh, situations what we are having. And the uh, most preferred tool is the mergers and acquisitions which not only helps companies to expand, but also diversify their business. A merger means an arrangement where one or more existing companies come together to make one new entity and set a few objectives together for themselves. So in the uh, 1956 Act, that is the Companies Act of 1956, the legal provisions pertaining to merger process were stipulated to section 391 to 394. And there the process was not so simple. It prescribed some cumbersome and time consuming process for all the companies, irrespective of the size of their net worth or the turnover. 
this uh, procedure was not only uh, cumbersome but also confusing and complex as it involved drafting of the merger scheme that we do now also but taking the judicial approval for the scheme and getting the board and the shareholders authorizations etc paved uh, was quite difficult small companies uh, with uh, fewer resources were also subject to the same complex procedure and it defeated the purpose for which the mergers were entered into and rather than being a facilitator it proved to be a deterrent for companies to go in for collaborations the same procedure for merger for companies for all sizes were proving to be counterproductive so this gave a rise for a need for simplified procedure and more efficient legal regime for the merger process and the companies act 2013 replace this earlier tds process with the new concept of fast track merger though the term merger has not been clearly defined unlike that 1956 act but we do have chapter 15 of the companies act which deals with compromise arrangements and amalgamations and section 233 read with rule 25 of the companies compromise arrangements and amalgamation rules uh, we'll call it the merger rules which deals with fast track merger so fast track merger deals with both merger and amalgamation uh, between small companies or holding companies and its wholly owned subsidiaries that is specified class of companies and this has dispensed off with the uh, with the cumbersome and time consuming process so uh, under section 233 it has simplified the process of merger procedure there is no judicial uh, approval which is required and no certain procedures for certain types of companies so that they are unable it enables them to expand without any much of a road block the filings have also as uh, so was saying there are two things we can expand the process or we can uh, cut down on the processes so the filings also required has been significantly reduced so the fast track mergers uh, has distance of with the tribunal approval for mergers uh, and now the cg that is the central government wherein the power has shifted to the regional government uh, regional director wide notification dated 19 december 2016 and the registrar of companies and the official liquidators are the authorities whose approval is required earlier uh prior to the amendment i'll be just giving the amendment right now the fast track merger or ftm was could be entered into between two or more small companies between a holding company and its wholly owned subsidiary but the amendment dated uh, notific uh, wide notification dated 1st february 2021 brought in further relaxations and with the insertion of section 1a which uh, gives provisions for the fast track merger which can now be entered into between any of the following classes of companies two or more startup companies or one more one or more startup companies with one or more small company so the combinations what we have with regard to the fast track merger has widened the definitions as has been provided for the holding company under section 246 in the companies act which only gives that uh, in relation to one or more other companies it means a company which has such companies are subsidiary and the company here includes a body corporate so this has even widened the scope of what is wholly owned and what is a subsidiary company subsidiary company as defined under section 287 of the companies act again talks about the relationship of any other company that is to say the holding company means a company in which the holding company controls so the concept of control has been clearly defined also though it is a topic of much discussion what exactly is the control factor so here we are talking about the composition of the board of directors control of the composition of the board of directors and also the second one talks about the exercise or controls more than one half of the total voting power either on its own or together with one or more of its subsidiary companies provided such class of such class of classes of holding companies as may be prescribed here we are talking about the layers what has been defined under the companies restriction on the number of layers rules 2017 shall not have layers of subsidiaries beyond the specified number with effect from 
20th of September 2017. So the layers have been very clearly mentioned that uh, you cannot have beyond the layers. So I'll not go deeper into the layers because uh, again, because of the shortage of time. So uh, coming to the definition of another one that is our small company again. So the small company means any company having a paid up share capital not exceeding 50 lakhs and such higher amount as may be prescribed where the uh, thing has been prescribed by two crores which will not be more than 10 crores or more or and the turnover of which is per profit and loss, as per the profit and loss account immediately preceding the financial year that is not exceeding two crores with our such higher amount as was prescribed. Now it is fixed at 20 crores and not more than 100 crores. So this has been the thing. And this clause shall not apply to a holding company. So a small company shall not be a holding company or a subsidiary company uh, unless it is a wholly owned, uh, not a subsidiary company. Then B, company registered under Section 8 and a corp company or a body corporate governed by any special act. So for the purposes of this clause, the paid up capital and the turnover of small company, which has been fixed at two crores and 20 crores respectively was wide notification, was wide the budget session of 2021. Now coming to the uh, pro benefits, what uh, our companies have because of this fast track merger, the process ha involved has become uh, shorter and also it has helped many companies to go in with the expansion and diversification, especially the bigger companies where you have a holding company and you have a wholly owned subsidiary. Like, for example, we had a order under say, a scheme of merger under Section 233, wherein Optimus Infracom Limited, uh, the holding company, was able to merge with well, amalgamate with two of its subsidiaries, that is MPS. Telecom Private Limited and One World uh, Teleservices Private Limited by the approval of the regional director in 2018. The main uh, reason for this amalgamation, what was co what was uh, theme was the synergy and efficient utilization of capital and resources. And again, one more uh, example where we have the QS Core Limited, which we have which amalgamated with four of its uh, fully wholly owned subsidiaries, one Greenpeace Landscape. Uh, India Private Limited, the Golden Star Facilities uh, and Services Private Limited, the MFX Infotech Private Limited, and the Trimax Smart Infra Projects Private Limited, wherein the Board of QS uh, Core approved the merger of Section 233 in 2021. Again, they also cited simplified management, greater structure, uh, greater management structure, then the integration and financial strength and simplification of the group structure, wherein it is possible to manage all the group companies in a better manner. So we have uh, seen that it is advantages to go with the expansion under the fast track merger, but it again has certain limitations in spite of the fact that it opens a easier gateway. Some of the companies to merge and it has paved way for an alternative processing structure or restructuring uh, process. There are some cautions which we have to uh, keep in mind when we look into the procedures. The scheme eliminates, though the scheme eliminates the involvement of NCLT. It gives significant power to the registrar of companies, the central government now delegated to the regional director. And if the regional director believes that the scheme is not in public interest or in the creditor's interest, then it may file an application to the uh, NCLT to be processing the merger to Section 232. This may result, this is only a may result, this may result in the uh, defeating the very purpose of fast track uh, merger itself. Then also, uh, a small imp uh, small things relating to whole uh, wholly owned subsidiaries in view of the view in view of what uh, roc feels or roc takes into account and our order to access or avail the fast track merger the holding company 100% shareholding it has to be in the wholly owned subsidiary and this must be from the immediately preceding uh, previous year or the financial year again until the 100% shareholding is not indicated in the e form, the ROC may not be providing for the uh, further process. 
So necessary documentations, uh, though it has reduced to quite an extent, again, uh, it may be increased, it may be reduced depending upon the stage in which the organizations are coming up with the merger process under Section 233. The time frame with, for completion of merger uh, may increase or decrease considerably depending upon the state in which it is going through. So with this practical difficulties uh, and uh, with all the uh, plunge, whatever the plunge, whatever the companies are going to be taking, so the pre-existing administrative burden will have to be also considered for the taxing of the companies. That is the tax provisions also of the companies, whether the scheme has it in the right essence. So uh, again, with these uh, interesting and uh, the convenient procedures of fast track merger, we will go to, I'll request now Darshana to take over for the procedures what are involved for uh, getting through with the FTM. That is your fast track merger. Thank you. Thank you, Shobha, ma'am. Uh, section 233 and rule 25 of the company's compromise arrangement and amalgamation rules lays down precisely what are the procedure that uh, companies are required to follow to ensure getting the scheme approved by the regional director. If you look at section 233 subsection 1 clause A, it speaks about sending a notice. Now, prior to going to uh, the procedure specified under the uh, section 233, it is very important for us to check the EOA and MOA of the transferor and transferee companies. Because if it is not authorized, if this uh, amalgamation, any kind of amalgamation, merger, demerger is not authorized by the MOA of the respective companies, then there is a requirement to amend the existing MOA AOA and uh, provide an enabling provision for the same and then go forward. So you will have to follow that procedure and then only under section 233, you can start getting your company merged uh, under the fast track procedure. Second thing will be to decide on uh, the basic concepts of the merger, basic concepts of what are going to be in the scheme of merger and preparation. Going into the preparation is also uh, a preliminary step uh, before getting yourself into the provisions of procedures prescribed under Section 233. Now, once these two are, these two are done, then we can decide or discuss on the procedure under Section 233. On this outset, I'll start with the procedure saying that Section 233, subsection 1, Require requires convening a board to approve the draft scheme. Once a board meeting is called and the draft scheme is approved, then the next step is about sending a notice of the fact that uh, this draft scheme has been approved by the board and also a copy of the uh, scheme as well as a copy of the board resolution and any valuation report or such other report to be in support of the scheme that is being presented. Now, if you look at uh, the, pro, uh, the rules, you'll also find that there is a particular form, CAA 9, which is specified for the for giving the notice to the registrar of companies to the official liquidator. You have to give registrar of the companies to the jurisdictional registrar. And in case of official liquidator, it has to be given to the jurisdiction official liquidator of the transferor company and the transferee companies. Uh, in, uh, in in most cases, why is that given to an official liquidator? The question arises because the transferor company uh, is going to be dissolved without winding up, which is going to be the effect of the proposed merger. Hence, a notice to the OL is required. Secondly, a notice to the jurisdictional ROC and also to any other persons affected by the scheme. That is what uh, the, the, the letter of the law states. So there is also an interpretation issue. Is there, is there any other authority or should it be sent to shareholders, creditors? Because they're all the part of the scheme and their interest is also affected. So this is being debated and interpreted at various levels. As of now, the provisions or the procedures that we follow thoroughly include sending of notice to the ROC and the respective OLs. Now, the third category of people is left the interpretation of the uh, of the authority as and the case as the case may arise. Now, 
uh, this the timeline for providing this notice is 30 days from the date on which the board meeting is convened and also the timeline for getting the objections or replies or representations if any from the ROC or the OL is 30 days from the date of receipt of notice in CA9 along with the copy of the scheme, the board resolution, the valuation report, etc. Now, where is this the second time limit specified? The second time limit is said in uh, the form itself. That is in CA9 itself. You can see the format. You will see that there is a mention of 30 days in the format itself where it says that the ROC or the respective authorities to whom the notice is sent within 30 days from the receipt of notice, they are required to come back with their objections, representations, if any. Section 233, clause, subsection 1, clause B states that the objections and suggestions received are considered by the, are to be considered by the companies in their respective general meetings. And the scheme is approved by nine, uh, scheme is approved by the respective members or class of members at a general meeting holding at least 90% of the total number of shares. So this is a specific requirement under Section 233. It is neither a special resolution nor the ordinary resolution, but a specific resolution with a requisite majority stated under Section 233, which is very similar to the, the requirement under Section 230, subsection 6. So here, if there are any objections or if there are any such uh, representations from the ROC or the OL, then such representations has to be discussed in the general meeting of the shareholders. And uh, the after discussing and after incorporating such record scheme has to be uh, representing 90% of the total number of shares. This is the requirement under the now before before uh, uh, before having the before coordinating or convening the general meeting, there is a procedure for sending upon the declaration of solvency. Now, this declaration of solvency is the very basis upon which Section 233 hangs on. Unless and until an auditor uh, gives a declaration of solvency, I mean the board of directors gives a declaration of solvency on the basis of an auditor's report, limited review auditor's report, a format of which again is annexed to uh, Form C A 10. Yeah. The, the regional director will not be able to take a decision because unless and until he indicates that either of the interest of the creditors, shareholders, or any uh, stakeholders for that matter is affected, and the, both the companies are solvent, there is no question of having the uh, scheme approved under Section 233. So the format is again specified under Section uh, uh, for the purpose of Clause C of Subsection 1 of Section 233. Uh, the declaration of solvency shall be filed by each of the companies involved in the scheme of merger or amalgamation in a prescribed form, which is CA 10, along with the fee. Obviously, along with the fee as may be provided by the companies, registration, registration office and fee rules 2014. Now, is there a timeline? Yes. Now, the timeline is before, after filing of CA 9 and before convening the meeting of the members and creditors for the approval of the scheme, you are required to file with the ROC CA 9, CA 10. Now, CA 9 as well as CA 10 are a physical format. So how do you file it? You file it by using a GNL1 form or GNL2 form as the case may be. So uh, this is the flow of events till CA10. Once the CA10 is filed, then section 233, subsection 1, clause B gets attracted and objections, if any, received within 30 days have to be taken to the general meeting where the shareholders holding not less than 90% of the share shall give approval for the same. Now, coming to the next aspect of it is about creditors. What about creditors approval? Creditors approval is also very similar to that of um, uh, the shareholders approval. It says that uh, the creditors are required to give their approval or representing at least nine creditors representing a majority nine tenths of the value of the creditors or class of creditors of the respective companies indicated in a meeting convened by the company by giving a notice of 21 days along with the scheme to its creditors for the purpose or otherwise approved in writing. So this million dollar question of just like how the shareholders meeting is required specifically under the section 233 clause subsection 1 clause B is a meeting of creditors also required because there is a portion stating that the creditors approval can be given in a manner otherwise in writing. So does it uh, does it specify that the, the approval has to be given through uh, a consent of 
graduates or in any other manner specified by the authority or as in interpreted by the professionals here. So that is again a question that the authority has uh, an authority to decide and left for interpretation. But anyways, it is, there are approvals required both from the shareholders end as well as the creditors end. In case of shareholders, we are clear that there is a requirement for calling an EGM and after filing of the declaration of solvency, we will call an EGM on receipt of objections or representations, if any, from the respective authorities. And it has to be approved by the shareholders, not, not representing not less than nine tenths of the total number of shares. When it comes to the creditors as per section 233 subsection 1 clause D, it says that a majority representing nine tenths in value of the creditors have to give their approval in in two ways. One by calling the meeting, at least providing twenty one days and calling the meeting and approving, or in a, another any another manner approved in writing. The only term, the only requirement is approved in writing. So it could be notarized, it could be in consent affidavit format, it could be in a letter format. It is all left for the authority that is regional director given the power to decide upon what is the other way in which the creditors can give their consent. So this is left for open discussion and a, uh, understanding. So with this, basically, we are done with the procedures of uh, convening the general meeting and getting the consent of etc. etc. Now coming to the filing aspects of it, once the general meeting is conducted and let's take, uh, let's say in both the cases of shareholders and creditors, there is a requirement to file MGT 14 by the companies uh, to the jurisdictional ROC in uh, specifying or attaching to it the shareholders resolution. Now, after that, the next step is required will be filing of form CA 11. CA 11 is to be filed within seven days from the conclusion of the meeting of the members or class of members or creditors as the case may be and it has to be filed to three authorities. First one, our approving authority, the regional director and to the regional director, the specified form is RD1. Second one to the ROC, respective ROCs and again, we can uh, use the form GNL1 for the purpose of filing. And also third authority will be our OL and uh, to the OL, we'll have to give either by speed post or registered post or by hand provided proper acknowledgement is given. So the timeline for the same is within seven days from the conclusion of the meeting of the uh, members and creditors. Again, a query arises in case of consent affidavits or if you're taking affid uh, approval in writing from the creditors, if the different creditors are giving in different dates, what shall be the date upon which we shall calculate uh, seven days from? So these questions are also left to interpretation, open discussions under section 233. Now, once you uh, once you give a form CA 11, then it is upon the authorities given about 60 days time to come back with their suggestions, with their uh, ideas, if any, with their inconsistencies with the procedure that they can uh, point out, uh, which we have followed, based on which we can make necessary rectifications or changes as required, and uh, the scheme will get approved. So the process is very simple. If you look at it, uh, there is only requirement to file few forms, get certain approvals, no requirement for going to the judicial process. Tying benefit is the basic uh, uh, attraction under section 233. While we say all this and while we say about the procedures, yet um, a question that comes in our mind is that with all these interpretational issues at various points which I have mentioned, uh, does the authority give leeway for all these things or does the authority stick to the strict following of the procedures without any change uh, from the letter of the law? So this is something we have to understand and identify and discuss on for ensuring easier and uh, ensuring that ensuring taking benefit of the time benefit given under Section 233 in comparison to Section 230 and 232. Now, once these procedures are done from the company's end, now what is the procedure or what is the requirement from the RD's end or from the regional director's end in complying with the uh, scrutiny of the application? So where no objection or suggestion is received by the scheme for the scheme by the ROC or by the official liquidator or by the objection or suggestion of the registrar or official liquidator is deemed to be not sustainable. Then the central government is of the opinion that the scheme is in public interest, is not in public interest or in the interest of the creditors. The share, uh, central government shall issue confirmation of the order and the order shall be in form CA 12. So we have filed uh, the application for submission, application of the 
scheme or scheme under fast track and in ca 11 and it was only to be filed by the transferee company once on the receipt of the same uh, once ensuring that the scheme is in public interest and there is no objection from the roc there is no objection from the official liquidator the rd can go ahead and issue an order in form ca 12 where there is objections then the rd and the, and if he, the rd feels that the scheme is not in public interest or in the interest of the creditors it may file an application directly before the nclt in form ca 13 within 60 days of receipt of the scheme so the timeline given to rd for analyzing the scheme for getting the objections from various authorities is 60 days uh, under the act and within that time it has to decide upon whether to issue the order in ca may make an application in ca 13 to the nclt or to give an order in CA 12 to the company for further uh, and for, for processing the further amalgamation and registration of it. So, this is what uh, we have explained here. This is the timeline given under the Act for the RD to decide upon our application from CA 11. So, let's assume that the RD has. Uh, in our situation, given approval in form CA 12, if so, the next procedure is of the part of the company to file form INC 28. Both the transfer and transferee companies to their respective ROCs, if they are in a different jurisdiction, is required to file form INC 20, uh, the order issued by the RD in CA 12 to the ROC in form INC 28. So with this, our amalgamation or merger is complete under section 233. And uh, the timeline for filing this INC 28 is 30 days uh, from the receipt of the order confirmation, along with the fee as provided under the company's registration office and fee rules 2014. So with this, our procedural requirement ends and the amalgamation takes into effect. Now with the, uh, with the amalgamation coming into effect, what is the things that we have to understand? How is it going to affect the activities, especially transfer a company? We have to understand that primarily with the amalgamation going through, the order of amalgamation coming and filing of INC 28, it is a deemed dissolution of the transfer company without winding up. So there are certain aspects to which we have to consider, like what, are, what is going to happen to the tangible assets? What is going to happen to the existing case? It will be captured in the scheme, obviously, but also what is going to be the effect of the registration of the uh, order with the ROC is something that we have to thoroughly understand. So all the properties and liabilities of the transfer company will become the properties and liabilities of the transfer company. All the charges on the properties of the transfer company will be transferred and will become as the charges of the property of the transfer company. Legal proceedings pending against the transfer company will be taken up as if it is pending against the transfer company. Any dues payable to the shareholders of the transfer company will become the liability of the transfer company. So, in effect, all the liabilities, all the assets, all the legal proceedings of the transfer company will get transferred to the transfer company. It is just the effect of amalgamation under Section 230 and 232 is nothing different from 233. So, it is not just uh, just uh, uh, just the effect is not very. Uh, particular to section 233. So effect of merger either in 230 or 232 or under 233 is going to be like this where the transfer company is not going to exist and all the assets, liabilities, legal proceedings of the transfer company will get carried forward and transferred to the transfer company. Subject to the provisions as mentioned under the scheme, there will be some specific manner in which they will want their transfer to happen, specific uh, uh, tranches in which they want the transaction to happen. All these innovations and ideas can be brought in the scheme. So subject to what is given in the scheme, this will be the effect of registration. Further, there will be surrender of PAN, IEZ or any such kind of registrations taken in the name of the transfer company will be uh, will be surrendered with the consulting authorities. And also now coming to the authorized capital. So once the transfer company is uh, transferring its undertaking, there will be an issuance of shares at the end of the transfer company. And for the purpose, it is important to uh, raise the authorized capital or revise the authorized capital of the transfer company. Now, the pay payment of stamp duty towards the same, if it is already paid by the transfer company in its uh, books, then that can be set off, set off for which all, for all this purpose, the order of the RD in form CA 12 can be utilized and uh, uh, can be taken as the document based on which the increase of the authorized capital will be proposed as well. 
Now, all the shares of the transfer of company will be cancelled or ex extinguished on merger or amalgamation and should not hold any share of the transfer of company on the amalgamation in its own name or in the name of any trust on behalf of the any of its subsidiary or associate company. Now, uh, this is just an overview of the forms that we are required to file. It has already been uh, explained, but yet again, going, having a run through it will help us. CA9, it is a notice uh, to the ROC, OL and other respective persons uh, affected by the scheme. It has to be filed to the ROC in form GNL1. To the OL, you can give it by registered post or by hand. And to other people also, you can give it to the state post or by registered post or hand. Now, declaration of solvency. This is a prescribed format CA 10 appended with a uh, audit report and statement of assets and liabilities. It has to be filed to the respective ROCs uh, in form GNL2. And also once on passing the shareholders resolution form MGT 14 has to be filed under section 117. Then there is a requirement to give uh, the scheme up, which is to be approved by which is approved by the members before the RD for their objections and understanding. It is given by the transfer company alone. It is given in format CA 11. It is filed uh, to the RD in G RD 1 to the ROC in GNL 1 and maybe to the uh, official liquidator it can be filed uh, in for, by speed post or by registered post. Now once on analyzing the entire scheme after objection, if there are no objections, if there, they already feel that is in public interest, CA 12 is issued and then further the companies are required to file INC 28. So on conclusion, what is the benefit? Ultimately, what is the requirement of having a separate section carved out for wholly owned subsidiary and wholly owned companies uh, for small companies or for startup is the time benefit. In comparison to section 230 to 232, the NCLT process, the time, long time drawn judicial process in order to escape from the same section 233 has been uh, introduced. With the tumultuous uh, market going heavy, it is important for small companies to push up their expansion program, to bring in resources and at that time when they're trying to thrive for their sustainability in the market, they cannot go behind huge and long drawn time and uh, time drawn judicial process. So in order to provide a solution to them to e ensure easy expansion for such small companies or for group companies, Section 233 was brought in. But as a concluding remark, I would like to say that has Section 233 really helped the object for which it has been brought in? Has the small companies or group companies or startup companies been able to get their expansion process done without any hassles? Has it been uh, clear? Has the law been uh, very open and clear and crisp in various aspects? Or is authority given to the RD completely to decide on various aspects? Are RDs utilizing their authorities to give uh, or to ensure timely disposal of the amalgamation application. So these are the questions that uh, still doom large, but yet there is a provision under Section 233. There is scope of improvement. Uh, there is uh, something that we can utilize for ensuring uh, expansion process for small companies as well without going to the NCRTs. On this, uh, I would conclude our presentation. Thank you, Shobha ma'am. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. K. S. Ravishandran, sir, for uh, in uh, for answering any questions and answers or if you have um, from the audience end. Darshana and uh, Shobha Sridhar. Very lucid uh, and simple presentation. Both of you have done. I think you may uh, stop the screen share. See, one uh, important thing which we normally discuss is the procedure under 233. Mostly, see, for, for example, if you go under 233 and uh, why you should not go under 230, 232 is a question which normally comes because the entire whole chapter of 230 to 240 have to be understood completely in order to work in the space of m and even within the unlisted companies. The whole chapter of 230 to 240, one must be able to have experience and understanding and experience. 230 to 240. Now, one of the things which we are normally we see is what is the procedure and what is the procedure here? What is the procedure there? 
And what is the procedure here? When I say what is the procedure there, I am talking about 230 to 232. And when I say what is the procedure here, I am talking about 233. So here, what was the procedure? Darshana and Dr. Shobha have explained it nicely. And it looks like there are a lot of uh, things that are uh, required to be done. And in terms of uh, NCLT uh, sanctioning uh, schemes, you will find the same procedure of the scheme getting approved by the board of directors, scheme getting approved by the creditors and shareholders, whether by way of affidavits, consent affidavits, or by way of any other means in the meeting. And there is a notice to the regulators. There is a order by the NCLT for convening the summoning the general meeting. As therefore, the point is that everything happens there also. The scheme is approved by board. The scheme is required to be approved by company, shareholders, creditors, stakeholders, we can say. Scheme goes to NCLT. Scheme goes to regulators. Scheme goes to sector regulator also. All these things have to fall in place. Advertisements are being given, ultimately petition stage, hearing date, and then sanctioning by the NCLT is, can be the shortest way of describing the procedure in NCLT route uh, for the purpose of understanding. Now, whereas ROC route is also requiring the same uh, procedural aspects to be gone into, the one difference which I find in 233 is that you give a front draft scheme to the ROC and the official liquidator. Under 233.1, and the draft scheme itself is supposed to be gone into by the regulator, the OL, as well as the uh, ROC. And objections, if any, they should be able to communicate for you to place it before the general body of the shareholders, and the shareholders will consider that. If you carefully notice 233.1 structure, it starts with the draft notice to be given to the registrar and to the official liquidator. And as Darshana said, 30 days time has been given to them. And sometimes the 30 days may not work. That's a different issue. And in terms of scheme of demerger, in case a demerger scheme is introduced, you may not require a notice to the official liquidator at all. Because in demerger, we are not going to use the provisions of uh, Section 233, particularly with respect to the dissolution of the transfer or company. There is no question of dissolution of the transfer or company in a demerger scheme. So there are certain practical issues which we need to understand. What happens is the objections and representations received are considered by the shareholders. And in a, in a general meeting, the language used under 233.1 in respect of creditors or shareholders, you should see in a general meeting, in a meeting. Another point is if you want 90% consent or one Tenth only can be objectors. The problem is, in a meeting, you may not have all the people coming in. Even though there could be a virtual meeting or hybrid meeting, it may be very difficult for you to gather this 90% at the meeting. And therefore, it is proper that it is considered for small companies, startup companies with less number of members, where board and shareholders are able to be in touch with each other. You are able to connect to them get them together on a particular platform and get it approved. So that is an aspect which we need to consider because the language used in 233.1 is in a meeting of the shareholders or the creditors. Another is, I do not find any reason there should be new objections and representations for the, uh, the central government for the purpose of you know 233 within brackets 3 because already they would have given their objections and it is considered by general meeting. So there can be objections only if the original objections received from the regional director through the ROC or the official liquidator are considered by the general body of the shareholders and they are not incorporated. Shareholders do not want the modifications or suggestions by the regional director. There, when you go to the general body, the general body does not do the remedy for the objections and you present the same scheme to the uh, the uh, regulator ROC and OL 2333 will come into picture. However, even if 233 comes into picture, I am of the view that there cannot be new objections. The objections have to be the original one to the extent not considered by the general meeting. We should understand the process here. And thereafter, if the central government feels that these objections can be overruled, they can overrule it. 
the self government feels that there is a question of public interest involved it is not in the interest of the creditors then your subsection 5 comes into picture wherein a procedure for the central government to file an application before nclt therefore 233 does not contemplate rejection of the scheme 233 gives a gateway for the central government to file the application to the nclt and go to the nclt and consider it where the language used is a tribunal may consider the scheme under 232 that is 233 file therefore it goes to the nclt by virtue of not your application by virtue of the application by the central government therefore consider the situation where this 9 1/10 or uh, 1 uh, 90% to consent is not available or you have violated certain procedures the regulator may not even consider 233 powers the regulator may not even consider 233 therefore please understand procedural infirmities may lead to a situation where the regulator does not say he is within his powers to exercise this jurisdiction we must remember this point very clearly in case the regulator applies the jurisdiction and create subjections and forwards to central government central government doesn't to overcome it and it is forwarded to nclt under 233 file the procedure which is followed at nclt also requires to be looked into therefore remember unless you have 90% consent do not apply under 233 at all once you have 90% consent there is no problem there could be some other objections only now if you go to nclt after all these stages merely for the purpose of considering the objections if any which the central government has thought it fit that it is not in the interest of the public or it is not in the interest of the creditors in such a situation when it goes to nclt it should not be in my opinion that is not uh, found out we do not know we have not argued that point in nclt it should not be considered as a first motion application you have gone through all the procedures of shareholders and creditors that too better than what 233 requires and it cannot be second motion also because in second motion the notice is issued to the regulators under 230 within brackets 5 230 within brackets 5 but we are here at 233 within brackets 5 we should be able to remember the distinction between that therefore notice giving to the note giving notice to the regulators also should not arise all that i feel is there shall be 16 class b notice of the hearing that must be the only procedure which i said is not clearly mentioned in 2335 because it simply says tribunal may consider the scheme under 233 this is one gray area the other thing which you may like to notice 23312 is a provision which enables any scheme of arrangement or compromise it is not necessary that we should always think about a dissolution of transfer or company without writing up therefore a scheme of arrangement or compromise under 230 or 232 very well can be presented in relation to the eligible companies under 233 are you able to follow 23312 therefore 233 has been expanded this is another important point the third important point the other important point which i would like to tell is 14 let us look at section sub section 14 23314 will say you may use the provisions of 232 therefore nobody is compelling because you are a startup you want to go under 233 at all because upfront you know whether you will be able to sail through 233 or not for example solvency issue could be there for example 90% concern may not be possible if an investor is objecting in a startup company the merger of one startup with another startup hanging in the balance because of one investor cannot go through the 233 you can always avail 230 within brackets i mean 230 and 232 it becomes easy so therefore 23314 you should first read and see whether our 
case, in the given case which you are going to deal with, at the boardroom first, is going to be passing through, sailing through the 233 various goalposts and reach up to the stage of whatever Darshana said under the effect of scheme under 233.9 or dissolution of transfer company under 233.8. Therefore, 233.1, read with the, the 25, rule 25, the eligibility of the companies, nature of companies, class of companies, and go to 14 and see whether we will be able to get the solvency issue, 90% consent issue, and thereafter decide 233. Apart from that, there is an island within 233. There is something which is totally disconnected with the 233 is 233.13. 233.13, as 13, number 13 will always be considered, is an island within 233, which confers power upon central government to use this provision to approve merger of companies. Central government is, apne aap can do this, is 233.13. The provision says central government may provide for merger or amalgamation of companies in such manner as may be prescribed is, in my opinion, not necessarily connected with 233 scheme at all. The scheme of the things under 233 is altogether different, in my opinion, under 233 within brackets 13. So we should remember that also. So therefore, we have to understand 233 as well as 230 and 232 for the purpose of going through the entire procedure. Another thing we need, we need to do is, in NCLT procedure, if you had any the difficulty in implementation, what normally you do is you invoke 233.1, I mean 2.31. 2.31, power of the tribunal to enforce compromise and arrangement under 2.31, they have the power to supervise the implementation. They have at any time give directions, modifications. They have the 2.31, subsection 2 is also important. Subsection 2 gives power to the tribunal that if it is satisfied, it is not possible to implement the scheme, it can pass orders. 231 come benefit is not there in 233. Therefore, we have to understand 233 from a gamut of uh, things. And that is why I said, don't practice 233 simply because 233 procedure of 9, 10, 11, you are aware. 9 is the CAA 9, first time you file it. 10 is the declaration of solvency, next time you file it. Then you file 11 for the purpose of going to the 233.3 stage, right? Once you reach 233.3 stage objections, thereafter central government overcoming it, and thereafter sanction or referring to NCLT, that's all. So that's all I want to just highlight these important uh, features of this provision. And uh, if there are some questions, we can take. Otherwise, we can call it a day because it is already 10.59. Thank you. Uh, Preeta? You may propose a word of thanks. Sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, I have a small question. I have a small question. Go ahead, sir. Sir, in uh, merging of banks, they also follow this procedure or they have some other procedures for merger of banks? You have to go under the, in any sector regulated company, we do not advise 233 at all. And you know that the Reserve Bank of India Act and Banking Regulation Act 1949. No way you can come under 233. 